Hello everyone. Hello. Welcome to our new study series in the book of Isaiah. It's going to take quite a while to get through, isn't it? I argue that uh, Jesus might return before we finish. <laughs> there are 66 books, 66 chapters, sorry, in uh, the book of Isaiah that are a window through which we can explore the entire narrative of the Bible, which has how many books in it? 66. 66. So Isaiah is a mini-map of the entire canon of Scripture, which is incredible, isn't it? We have here in this one book the culmination of God's truth. So it's going to be a great few years studying this together, isn't it? The Bible has 66 books. How many chapters does I, does I have? 66. 66. And we see here echoes of Genesis in chapter 1, as Isaiah refers to Sodom and Gomorrah. We see echoes of Exodus in chapter 2, in regards to the condemnation of idolatry. And in chapter 66, right at the end, we see the new heavens and the new earth. Which is which book in the Bible? Revelation. Revelation. It's truly amazing how it all fits together. Incredible when you think that the book of Isaiah was written over 700 years before Christ's coming and the New Testament being start to be formed. Yet it all interlinks it. It all maps out. It's almost as if the author is actually higher than the, than the writers. <laughs> it would make sense, wouldn't it? A significant milestone in the book of Isaiah is what we've just read together in Isaiah chapter 40, where Isaiah is recommissioned to bring a ministry of hope. In Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3, Isaiah speaks of a voice of one crying out in the wilderness, preparing the way of the Lord. And in book 40 of the Bible, who knows what book 40 is of the Bible? Who knows? It's Matthew. It's the start of the, of the New Testament, where we have the same recommission. And in chapter three of the book of Matthew, so Isaiah chapter 40, verse three, the 40th book, of, 40th chapter of Isaiah, the 40th book of the Bible, in chapter 3, we meet a voice of one crying out in the wilderness, preparing the way of the Lord. Who was that? John the Baptist. John the Baptist. It's incredible, isn't it, how it all interleaves. The book of Isaiah is amazing. And um, I'm a fan. Are you a fan? Yeah. yeah. I tell you, he was a really big fan. Paul. He quotes Isaiah over 80 times in his epistles. Did you know that? He loved Isaiah. People say that Isaiah is the Romans of the Old Testament. In fact, we should say Romans is the Isaiah of the New Testament, shouldn't we? <clears throat> and in this introductory session, what I want to do is I want to give you a brief overview of Isaiah. So we haven't even started yet, Colin. You've got a long way to wait till Isaiah 53. Um, we're going to begin with the author and then talk about the context of his ministry. So firstly, who's the author of Isaiah? Can anyone guess his name? <laughs> it's Isaiah. <laughs> and I, Isaiah means salvation of the Lord. Can we say that together? Salvation, salvation of the Lord. And, and someone's name is the, is the core identity of the man, isn't it? And, and he lived and breathed Jesus. Isaiah met with Jesus in glory in chapter 6. Isaiah heard the word of God. Amen? And who's Jesus? The, the word made flesh. And as prophet, Isaiah sought to bring the nation of Israel back to Jesus. There were lots of of people called Isaiah at the time. It's still a common name today, isn't it? But this Isaiah is distinct um, for being Isaiah, son of Amos. 
but this is not to be confused with the prophet Amos. They're not related. Isaiah was married to a prophetess, which some in more liberal circles would interpret as Isaiah having a wife that shared in his gifts. But I think it's more the fact that Isaiah's wife was married to the prophet, hence the name prophetess. In the same way, Harriet has a status at Norfolk for being the pastor's wife. The prophet's wife is the prophetess. Isaiah had two sons. They had really catchy names. Um, he named them prophetically. Shia Jashub, if we say that together. I wish Ali was here. <laughs> uh, she's got a plant in our house called Nebuchadnezzar. So every morning she would get up and say good morning to Nebuchadnezzar so she could learn how to pronounce his name. <laughs> Brilliant. Shia Jashub, say that with me. Shia Jashub. Um, which translates to a remnant shall return. And that was part of Isaiah's message. A remnant shall return. Maya Shalalel Hashbaz. <laughs> you ready? <laughs> Maya Shalalel Hashbaz. Well done. It's a delightful name, isn't it? Do you know what it means? Quick to plunder. Imagine calling your son that. <laughs> Quick to plunder. Yeah. I'm not naming names, but one of my sons is fitting of that name. <laughs> he starts comprehensive school today. Didn't even say goodbye, just left the house. <laughs> no pictures, gone. <laughs> but these names, they both, they were there to denote the, the fate of God's people, as, as Isaiah preached and prophesied to, to the chosen. Now, we know that Isaiah was called uh, to the ministry in the year of King Uzziah's death, which was 739 BC, 739 years before Christ's birth. And Isaiah ministered through the reigns of three kings after him. And Isaiah died in 686 BC. And tradition argues that Isaiah was killed by King Manasseh, by his order, and he was cut in two with a wooden sword. It's brutal, isn't it? Now, there's no biblical support for this. It is just tradition. Um, but it is alluded to in Hebrews 11, isn't it? Where it says of some being sawn in two. Yeah. Isaiah saw Israel, his people, and the country that he loves. He saw them fall away from God and he grieved it. He, he was heartbroken by it. Just as many of us are when we see the state of Wales today. It's heartbreaking, isn't it? The Lord has revived us. Three times of note, and yet we're so quick to wander, aren't we? And it's heartbreaking. So we can sympathise with Isaiah here. It's really going to speak into our context today. 26 times in this book, Isaiah cries out to his people affectionately. He says, my people, my people. Can you say that with me? My people, my people. And that's what I have in my own calling to this valley. I don't mean to be possessive, but the people here are mine. But God called me here to preach the gospel to these people, and I take ownership of that. I, I have this supernatural love for, for even the vilest in this valley. And well, Nodfer knows how anxious and cross I get when false prophets tread on our turf. Because these are my people. And um, my prayer is that, that our churches will, will have the same zeal that Isaiah has for our people. My people. I've quoted this a lot of late, but Richard Baxter, and the reformed pastor, you lads are reading it, you've read it. If they are worth Christ's blood, they are worth your labour. Our neighbours, they're our people, my people. And Christ has died to, died to redeem them. May we share in 
Isaiah's zeal for his own. Should we say, my people again? My people. After the death of Solomon, Israel divided. You had the ten northern tribes that formed Ephraim. And who knows what the capital of, of the north was? Samaria. They whispered it. <laughs> Samaria. <laughs> Isaiah prophesied their fall to Assyria some 80 years before it happened. That's incredible, isn't it? 80 years ahead of his time and he's making these accurate prophecies. Does that impress you? You wait to see what else he comes up with. It's incredible. <laughs> And then you had the, the, the southern kingdom, the tribes of Benjamin and Judah, who had the kingdom in the south, and they, they retained the Davidic line. So it was King Uzziah, King Jotham, King Ahaz, and King Hezekiah. And that's who um, Isaiah prophesied to. Uzziah reigned for 52 years, and he got involved in the priest's ministry. He was judged for it. God gave him leprosy. That'll teach him. <laughs> Jotham, he reigned for 22 years as the Assyrians were on the rise. And then Ahaz, well, he made alliances with the Assyrians to protect Judah uh, from Egypt. And he got in trouble for doing that because he was reliant on the world's powers and not on God. Then you have Hezekiah. He reigned for 42 years and he was a good king. He listened to Isaiah and he led the people back to God. We need a Hezekiah here, don't we? Amen. We need to pray for our monarchy and pray for our leaders. Pray for our Hezekiah. Amen. And this 50 year period or so of Isaiah's ministry was one of geopolitical upheaval. And Isaiah's message in the mess is to remember that God has got this. Should we say that together? God has got this. What we read earlier, comfort, comfort my people. Should we say that together? Comfort, comfort my people. Now the word comfort here in Isaiah 40 verse 1 has taken on a different meaning for us today. We understand comfort in a Welsh context as a kutch, don't we? If you want to be comforted, what do you want? You want a kutch, didn't you? Yeah. But this is not what the word means. The word comes from the Latin comfortare. Can you say that with me? Comfortare. Right? And um, this literally breaks down into come. We all know what that means, don't we? And fort. As in a tower block. As in a castle fort. When I advertised this new study series, did you notice I put Folly Tower? Is it fault, comfort, comfort, come fault, come protect me? Yeah? Barbara said it, strength. Yeah? So during all this political upheaval of Isaiah's time, Isaiah's message to the people is to seek the Lord's strength. Comfortare. Say that with me. Comfortare. Come fort. Yeah? Come fort, come fort, my people. Beautiful, isn't it? The second key theme of the book is that the problems that we face out there in the world as Christians are nothing compared to the problems we will face in here as a church if we do not get right with God. And the beginning of the book of Isaiah, <laughs> Isaiah addresses the sins of God's people. He warns of judgment for the church if we do not repent. In chapters 13 to 23, Isaiah attacks the pagan nations who surrounded God's people. Um, he says they will receive God's wrath for their attack. On God's people but but judgment always starts with the church amen? amen the problems we face out there are because we have not made a stand in here we're quick to blame aren't we 
oh, it's the devil's fault, it's secular culture. No, we should have made a stronger stand for the truth. In the church, we should be honouring Christ. If, if the church was holy, we would not have lost our saltiness and we would still be making an impact in the world today. But we're under judgment, aren't we? A church across Wales, we're, we're too often, we're quick to blame the devil, we're, we're quick to blame the fallen world for our problems. No one's coming anymore. We're in decline. But Isaiah reminds us that we've got to examine our first, our, our, ourselves first before we judge those outside. If we are God's children and we can't live a life where Jesus is our everything, and I mean everything, not just on a Sunday morning, but right through the week, how dare we ask our neighbour to come to church on a Sunday if we are not taking Jesus seriously ourselves? It's a strong challenge, isn't it? If we take Jesus lightly as believers, think how unbelievers will take it by our example. Judgment starts in the church, doesn't it? It is sad to say that our, our post-Christian culture is judgment on the church here in Wales. This is our fault. Isaiah chapter 24 to 27. It's all about hope in the reunification of Israel and Judah. And it's interesting that today we meet as we come together as two churches. Isn't it beautiful? You are right to choose Isaiah, Colin. <laughs> Chapter 28 to 39, you have all the prophecy of, of the Assyrians destroying Israel. Isaiah 40 to 66, uh, what the rabbis call the consolation. So these chapters are intended to bring hope to the Jewish exiles, um, that God will bring them back and that the two kingdoms will be one again in the future. Unity, blessed unity. Should we say that together? Blessed unity. We have here, in the book of Isaiah, a message of comfortare. Say that with me, comfort, comfort my people. Comfort, comfort my people. Comfort, you're gonna like this, Jose. Comfort, incidentally in the Hebrew, if you look at it, it's norchem. Can you say that? Norchem, which means repent. <laughs> <laughs> so to know God's comfort, to know God's strength is to do what? Repent. repent. Repent of your sin. Turn from the things that inhibit your relationship with God. Follow Jesus. You will be comforted. It's beautiful, isn't it? And Isaiah speaks much of Jesus in this book. As I said earlier, Isaiah met Jesus in chapter 6. And to prove this to you, Isaiah made many prophecies about, about Jesus that came true 700 years later. You were impressed with the 80. 700 years later. Again, it's almost as if there's a higher mind behind this all, isn't it? Isaiah said that the Saviour will come. Isaiah 7.14 and Isaiah 9.6-7 and he did. Matthew 1, 18 to 25 Hallelujah! Isaiah said in, in Isaiah chapter 11 verse 1 that the Saviour will be of the line of Jesse. Tick! Fulfilled Luke 3.23 Hallelujah! Isaiah said that the Saviour will perform miracles Again fulfilled, you can take your pit there, can't you? <laughs> Matthew 9, 35, Jesus went into the towns and villages and he healed the sick. Isaiah 53, you get a little taster. <laughs> he predicts that the Saviour will be rejected, wounded, silent before his accusers, crucified pierced for our transgressions. That's an incredible prophecy. He 
didn't just say killed, he said pierced. Centuries before crucifixion was even invented. Incredible. And Isaiah also says he'll be buried with the rich. Matthew 27. And there's still a prophecy of Isaiah's yet to be fulfilled. But on Isaiah's current success rate, I have no doubt that it will be. And that's that this saviour will then return. And he'll make all things new. Come for Tari. You say that with me? Come for Tari. To the saved. It's terrifying for the lost. Which is why we need to get out there and share the gospel with them today. All evil is going to be burned up in holy wrath. Divine purifying fire. And we will reju rejoice in the shadow of the cross for your loved ones who you hold so dear. They're in a lot of trouble when that day comes. Stand firm for Christ. Amen. Isaiah was seen as a prophet, but as we will see in this study together over the coming years, he was in fact an evangelist too. He preached Jesus Christ, clear as day. In the midst of trouble and turmoil, at an international level and at a personal level, the message of Isaiah <clears throat> is to repent, follow Jesus, be comforted. And this was declared 700 years before the birth of Jesus. Incredible. It's as relevant today as it's ever been. Amen? Amen. Repent, follow Jesus, be comforted. Should we say that together? Repent, Repent follow, follow Jesus, Jesus, be comforted. If you want comfort in the turmoil, listen to the message in the mess. Repent. Follow Jesus. Be comforted. Amen? Amen. Amen.